Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans number 49. I'm Fred Green. We only have two more Mulligan episodes left with Tony Manzoni, and this is part two of episode 595 that is our third segment covering the topic of taking your game to the next level one club at a time. We started with last week's Mulligans episode, and part two was also just released as Golf Smarter number 734. So the you, you got that here? We had two full episodes that we've broken up into three <laughs> about taking your game to the next level one club at a time with our buddy Tony. I hope that makes sense. Now, Tony's book, The Law is Fundamental, One Simple Move, Better Golf Forever, is available on Amazon to read both as a paperback or in Kindle format. But if you prefer to watch this video of the same title, I'm happy to share the private link to watch it online. Just send me your request by clicking on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com or email to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com. Golf Smarter Mulligans is brought to you by twoguyswithgolfballs.com. This is it. The golf ball deal that you will regret if you miss it. Premium used golf balls that are closer to brand new than anything you'll ever find on the golf course. I promise. So before time runs out, April 1, 2020, just spend more than $49 at twoguyswithgolfballs.com, use Golf Smarter at checkout, and receive 20% discount on your entire purchase. We will be playing golf again this year. It's going to happen. So get the balls out of the way now. Email your friends. Scream about it from the 18th green if you get to play. Post it on your social media. But the clock is ticking louder and louder. Spend $49 at twoguyswithgolfballs.com. Use Golf Smarter at checkout and save 20% on your entire purchase. And remember, if you're buying Pro V1s, you're going to pay half price for those than you would usually pay. It's an amazing deal. Only at twoguyswithgolfballs.com. Now let's pick up right where we left off of Golf Smarter 734 for part three of three on taking your game to the next level one club at a time with Tony Manzoni. I was playing yesterday with some guys and one of them drove the green with a flag in the back and left himself about a 12 foot putt for eagle. He had more mm -hmm. pressure on him than the rest of us did because we were, you know, putting for par or bogey. And he was putting. That, all the pressure was on him, not the three putt. <laughs> well, but, but to see, there, there you go. It's a 12-foot putt. Right. It, 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 it hasn't changed. It's a 12-foot putt. Uh, but it's how, it's how we deal with it. If it's a 12-foot putt for a triple bogey, his chances are probably better to make it than if it's a 12-foot putt for an eagle. And yet, it's still a twelve foot putt. But it, it, again, it becomes, uh, you know, it's it, there's a value associated with it, and and that's where we get into trouble in this game. Uh, if you could, but we're but we have emotions, and that you know, it's easy for me to say that, but we have emotions, and and we we have pride, and we have ego, and we have all these things that we have to deal with. So, um, but there is no such thing as pressure. Uh, that's a that's a manifestation of our mind where we perceive things that are things, this is more valuable than that. I want to be able to tell everybody I eagle this hole. Uh, and so, you know, this, this becomes a, a d more difficult than a 12 foot putt is. Uh, but who, who knows that button? I, I, if I, if I knew how to press that button, we wouldn't be talking, you know, I'd be in the Caribbean in a big ship or something, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the constant dilemma that we all face as players. But I mean, the reality of it, there is no, there is no such thing as pressure. It's just perception, you know? Well, I, um, I, I would think that a 12 foot putt for Eagle, for an amateur, the guy's in his head going, I got to make this putt. I have to make this, putt. I have to make this putt. Well, he's doomed. Right. But on the professional level, a 12 foot putt for Eagle to win it's a difference. I mean, you're saying he's not going, I have to make this putt. I have to make this putt. Well, I think professionals have a little better idea of uh, what, what is the percentage of makes with a 12 foot putt on tour. Hmm. Uh, and if I, I think if you, if, if you look at statistics, 
you know, they don't make every one of them for sure. I would, I would probably uh, say that you've got maybe a 40% chance of making it. If you hit 10 balls on a 12 foot putt, you probably make six or, 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 or four, but it's a lot, the, the percentage is a lot higher. And, and, and that's another thing I tell my boys, look, if you got a 20 footer, know that that's, that's a low number percentage on tour to make for sure. So relax a little bit, put a, put a good rule on it. And if you, if you don't three putt it, if you roll it up there close, or you sometimes make it bravo. But if you don't make it and you get it up by the hole, good job. And tap in the putt, go to the next hole. Uh, you've got to be realistic about putts. I mean, I've had, I've had boys on my team that miss a 50 footer and you know, they'll lip it out and they'll go crazy. I said, what are you, what are you insane? Do you think you're going to make a 50 footer every time? You know, but that see that. But the when you get that guys, close, I mean, like when it lips out at, from fifty feet, of course you're gonna be like, oh, I wish that would have gone in. But you should laugh. You should laugh. Holy mackerel! Almost made that thing. It, 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 it's, it, it's the way you look at it. it you know, it, it, Jordan Spieth. I mean, he's like a wizard. I, I I've never seen anybody make long putts as many times as he he does. And when he misses, but you can't fall apart at the seams. It's something that's in, in unrealistic. I mean. You just can't. And I think the better the better players handle it differently. They'll they'll smile to themselves with a little wry smile. God, I almost made that. But they're not beating themselves up because they they missed it. And I mean, you, you just have to be a lunatic to think that. But young people, especially young people, they think that everything is makeable. And when you miss, it's a disappointment. Well, not always. You know, if if you've got a a thirty or forty footer and you roll it up there a couple of feet from the hole, good job. And tap it in and go to the next hole. Uh, but but again, uh, I think that the unqualified player, the high handicap player, or the mid handicap player, or even the scratch player, we have a different view of things than the than the guy that's on the tour playing. You know, I think that you, when you talk about young people today and getting upset about missing. Uh, 50 foot putts you probably don't play golf video games do you tony because they make those all the time <laughs> <laughs> no i don't i try to stay away from that stuff me too because i i have a kind of personality that that's all i'd be doing <laughs> <laughs> um i want to get into the long irons uh you, you talked about the seven iron um and the different shots that you can have with a seven iron I know for me, one of the shots that I like to practice a lot, I'm about 145 with my 7-iron, and the fact, mm-hmm. that, the fact that you said 180 just blows my mind. But uh, So I'm about 145, but I also know that where I play, how often I play, where I play, um, it, there's a lot of trees. And so there, a shot that I have to have in my bag is to be able to punch it back out to the fairway and keep it under the branches – and so for me, I can do uh, a a seventy yard or a hundred yard shot with my seven iron, just letting it roll out, just you know punching it out. So that that is definitely sure. one of the shots that I practice. Um, and so what, let's talk about long irons and other things you can do other than just hit, you know being on the driving range and hit ball after ball after ball. How far? How straight can I hit it? What other things can I do to take my game to the next level? Well, when it comes when it comes to a club more than a, a six iron, when it comes to five, four, three, two, possibly one, um, the first thing I say is take those clubs and throw them in the garbage, and go get yourself some rescue clubs mm-hmm. that have the same numbers because they're a, it's a different world. Uh, getting a, a a three iron, two iron up in the air, high enough to where when it comes down on the gr- green, it's going to stay is really difficult. It takes a lot of strength and it's, it's a much harder club to hit than if you get a three rescue or a two rescue or whatever. Uh, those, those kinds of shots are, it's, it's hard to have a lot of shots with a long iron, you know, uh, but you can, you can do a little bit more with a rescue club. Because of the, the width of the bottom of the club you can get it out of higher grass. You can't do that with a with a, 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 a hosled club, uh, like a two iron or three iron. There's no way. Uh, but a, that's why the pros in the past, when they got the ball in heavy rough, they had to use their four wood or five wood. But now that they, these rescue clubs are just un- unbelievable. Um, but the, there, there's not much you can do with, with 
those kind of shots, those 200 yard shots or 180 yard shots, depending on how far you hit a ball. Uh, but for me, I hit my, my three rescue about 200 yards, sometimes 210, but uh, two, two, that number two is what, what I'm selecting because mm-hmm. I always leave a little bit, a little bit for error. Uh, but there's not much you can do with them. You, hopefully you can, you don't have too many of those shots per round really, because it would make a long day. Yes, it would. <laughs> I'm just curious. Uh, are you playing tailor-made clubs? Uh, no, uh, actually, uh, uh, somebody uh, turned me on to a, a club called XXIO, uh-huh. uh, and it's, uh, it's a Japanese brand carried by Shrixon, and they're expensive as hell. I will tell you that, but they're the best clubs I've played in a long, long time. Especially the rescue clubs, the driver, and the fairway, the three wood. Three has always been a tough club for me off of a tight line. And these these clubs, I don't know what it is about them, but it gets the ball up in the air really easy. So mm. I'm at that age now that anything I can do to make it easier, I, I'll go for it. Right. No, the reason I was asking is because I think that TaylorMade was one of the first to bring out that club, and they called it a rescue club. I think that's a, 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 a brand name, Rescue, but they're actually referred to as hybrids. Is that what a hybrid is? Yeah, they're yeah, yeah. Hybrid or utility, uh, like the my XXIOs. This is U four, U five. You know, everybody has their their way. But that I like rescue because that that, that really describes it to me. Uh, <laughs> when you pull, if I had to pull out a four iron today, I, I would need to be rescued. Believe me. Yeah, it's amazing how it cuts through long grass like butter on those clubs. It, it really makes oh, a yeah. huge difference. The, 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 they put the CG on the golf club, the center of gravity on the golf club, uh, on these cl- uh, new clubs. It just gets that ball up in the air really easy. And, <clears throat> you know, that's what that's what you fight as you get older. You get slower and you get weaker. So the, the shots that you could get up in the air, like Nicholas, you know, they said that Nicholas could hit a two, a one iron, the height of an eight iron. Wow. Like what a huge advantage that is. Uh, but it takes tr- tremendous strength to do that. Right. So let's move on to the... Um what used to be called fairway woods and now they're called fairway drivers or uh, fairway metals because nobody makes a wood anymore. Um, what do you see, use them for? Uh, how many, you know, you carry two of them, the advantage of having multiple ones uh, and you know, what is the best thing we can do to again, take our game to the next level with those clubs? Well, the fairway woods are very important. Uh, because they put you in a, on the par fives, they put you in a in a position to where you can hit a, a, a somewhat easy third shot, you know, where it's in your sweet spot area, where you let's say your wedge or nine iron. Um, the fairway woods are important, uh, and a lot of times uh, it's best to use a fairway wood off the tee on a lot of holes. Uh, the distance difference isn't that uh, uh, isn't that why no you know i i have again with a lot of my players i say look this hole doesn't call for a drive you don't need that distance you can put the ball in a position where you have a fairly easy shot and then you don't run the risk of you know hitting it in the trees or whatever uh but a lot of people are stuck on that driver they pull that driver out no matter what the distance of the hole or no matter how narrow it is um so the fairway woods can be used off the fairway but they can also be used off the tee uh, now I wouldn't hit. I would I would be using my three wood most of the time when I was opting when I said okay I'm not going to use my driver on this hole, but there are times that I watch on the tour where the guys are using an iron off the tee. Uh, of course they hit an iron a lot farther than the average player. But the point is is that in, in managing yourself around the golf course, you you have to look at the hole and appraise okay where do I want to hit it, where don't I want to hit it. Okay, and then what's the what's the club I can use to, to get somewhere in that area? Because the, the the woods are just to set the hole up. You're, you're not going to drive the green, uh, so uh, 20 yards or whatever between the driver and three wood isn't that a, that significant. Uh, but unfortunately, everything is stressed today about distance and not shot making. I think a lot of players, a lot of people that play the game. Uh, would be better off not using their driver as much as they do 
and putting the ball in play. And then and then on the second shot on a par five uh, for a lot of good players, they'd be much smarter to hit an iron up there within, you know, that 60, 70 yard range and then throw that thing up on the green. Uh, even even uh, Sam Snead, who is a long driver in his day, said, if I can't hit a high lofted club on the second shot on a, dry, on a, on a, on a par five, I'll hit an iron into, into my wedge area. Uh, that's the way you play the game. Sure, uh, but but unfortunately, you know we're sed- we're seduced by knocking it on a par five and two. You know when you're young enough to do it, and the ball's coming in too low. If it hits the green, uh, it's going to go to the back of the green. So you're going to be looking at a long putt, and you, now you got to try to two putt for that birdie. And if you three putt, it really demoralizes you. Where if you knocked it up there with a wedge, you got a good chance to hit it 10, 15 feet good chance to make that putt. So uh, it's just a different mindset. Uh, and and these are the things that you have to do to keep the round going mentally. Uh, you don't want a lot, a lot of up and downs emotionally. And you, you put yourself in that position when you try to hit those, I hope I can get this on in two. You know, that, that, that's where the ego gets involved, and that's what you got to eliminate. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know that Many times that if, say, on a par five especially, you can really use strategy to your advantage here uh, because of that extra shot that you're given. Um, so that if my drive uh, on a par five is leaves me 300 yards out, instead of trying to pull out my fairway metal, my four wood, um, and try to get it, you know, Listen, it's 300 yards out. I'm not going to be able to reach it. But then I'm going to leave myself a a, a 60 yard shot, a 40 yard shot. I'm not as comfortable with those. I'd rather take my nine iron and hit it twice and get close to the pin in three, than try to get there in two and not and come up short and then have that awkward distance in the middle there. Yeah, there's no question about it. That, those those shots where you say the 30 and 40 yard shots, those are really difficult shots even yeah. for the pros. They're not easy shots. Uh, well, anytime you're having a, you know, not take a full swing, it, it, it becomes a, a little bit more difficult. And, and those little tender wedges are tougher than heck. Yeah. Uh, so that, you know, you just watch, watch the good players play. Uh, and, and you're going to see that their strategy is a lot different than the average guy. The average guy swinging from this, you know, from his toes to hit as far as he can hit it on every club, which is, you know, borderlines on being a little nuts. And the same thing that um, what we, you had talked about is using a fairway wood off the tee, fairway metal, fairway driver, off the tee on holes that either have narrow fairways or aren't as long. Again, I don't want to get too close and make it a difficult second shot. I want to be in the range of what I think is a good shot for me, like 110, 125 yard shot. I'm real confident with those far more than I am with a 40. So I'll take that fairway wood off the tee. Sure. And, and even if sometimes, look, even if sometimes it's a long hole, but there's a lot of problems that the, that the designer put on the hole. They put in a lot of big fairway bunkers that are hard to get out of. They put, they put water, they put out of bounds. Uh, it's still sometimes, it's, even though it's still a long hole and you're not going to be able to get on in two, uh, you've got to go ahead and, and swallow that bitter pill and put that thing in play and then get hit another shot and keep it in play and then trust your wedge or putter. The worst thing that's going to happen, you're going to walk away with a bogey, but you're going to eliminate that big number by trying to stretch out uh, because the hole is long without looking at the factors that are involved at that in the designer, you know, and he, he set that up for you to come on, hit that driver, buddy. That's what I want you to do. Uh, uh, you know, like a, it's like a sucker pin. You, know? right. you, know you have we, to use your head when you play. Right. You know what we call that, Tony? What's that? Golf smarter. Yeah, golf smarter. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, I think, I think there was a hole at, at, in the Masters that Hogan always purposely hit to the right of the hole or, or right of the green, just on the fringe, and then chipped up and putted. And they always said, "Why do you do this?" Because this hole, if you if you hit the wrong side of the green, it's going to kick right into the water. So even the great Hogan, who really mastered hitting the ball, he had a strategy sometimes where um, he he swallowed that bitter pill because he wanted to keep, he wanted to eliminate the big number. 
And and you you got to do that when you play the game. And it's like a chess game. It's not all about force. Sometimes you have to have a little finesse. Yeah. Let's wrap it up with the driver, and I'll I'll start with that one. I have um I I don't like to just walk onto a golf course and tee off. I, I really need in my mind my mental preparation i need an hour to hit balls to p- practice short game a bunch of shots in the short game very few shots with a driver very sh- few shots with my long uh, my fairway metal uh, but i'll spend a lot more time on short game stuff <clears throat> when i'm warming up but when i do take out the driver instead of taking full swings with it I'll try to swing so easy that I only hit it 100 yards or 150, but try to, you know, at a specific target right at it. And that allows me to get a rhythm going and put the ball, um, you know, a short distance and feel more confident about taking a big swing after that. What would you advise on driver for, you know, again, for your warm up session or your practice session that's going to help your game keep the ball in the fairway? so critical with a driver well you know the old, the old saying i want to swing fast but not hard uh with the driver the the, the driver is a is a wonderful club and and it's and, it, and used properly it's a great tool but it can be your worst enemy if you're if you're thinking about distance uh, lee trevino uh w- once was talking about playing with nicholas and how far nicholas hit it compared to everybody else and he says, so when I played with Nicholas, I would try to uh, try to hit the ball 230 yards off the tee. And when I did that, I hit it about 270. He said, but when I tried to hit it 270, I hit it 230. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that's just su- such great wisdom because that's that's so much the truth. How many times have we got up on a par five and it's a long one, so we're going to give it that extra, and we, we throw it from the top and we get a little steep with it, we pop it straight up in the air like a wedge or we hit a way right or way left, there's a speed that you you have to get used to with the driver. And, and a lot of it has to do with defocusing on the ball, defocusing on any thought of hitting, and swinging from point A to point B in a rhythm that you can keep your balance. And if you do that with the driver, you're going to keep the ball in play most of the time. But most people, you watch them, and they'll swing the driver a lot harder than they do any club in their bag. That's the problem with the driver because, again, the emphasis is always on distance instead of direction and placement. That, the, To me, the driver is the placement. It sets the hole up for the next shot. It's not I'm going to hit it into infinity because well, no one does that. And, and, and you know, then you see Rory McIlroy or some of these guys that hit it you know, pretty close to 400 yards. And you know, we can't wait to get to the T to do that. Well, no, uh, you're not in their ca- category and, and never will be. You know, you have to play the game based on your game and not anybody else's. And I highly recommend for anyone listening there, find the speed that you can finish perfectly and hold your follow through position where you're in balance. That's the speed you should swing the driver. Uh, and, and the better you get, and the, you can make it go a little faster, and, but still be unbalanced. But if you're falling all over the place, you're swinging too hard. Phenomenal tip. That is such a fabulous piece of advice. Oh, my God, I'm so happy with that. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> okay. I got to end uh, here with a quick anecdote uh, about my round yesterday. I was playing with these three guys that are actually around the same age as my younger son. And one of them... Uh, my my son wrestled in high school for four years, and one of the guys that um, I was playing with wrestled against my son's team, and so he the, he knew him, and I and so because I knew that the kid wrestled, it, it allowed me to you know communicate with him in a, in a better level. Uh, but what I noticed in the first three holes, four holes, he had absolutely no hip turn on his swing. And his address, mm-hmm. his address position was pretty much kind of slouchy shoulder stand straight up. So he really wasn't in a ready position and he wasn't doing anything and he couldn't get the ball off the ground. He was rolling it. He was duffing it. He was missing it left and right. So I, I do not 
give advice, swing advice on, on a golf course. I, I don't do that. And sometimes if I have an observation that might help on a mental part or a strategic part, I'll do that. But I'll stay away from swing mechanics, especially during a round. But I said to the guy, when I found out that he wrestled, I said, where do you get, where do you get all your power um, when you wrestle? And he said, in your hips. And I went, uh-huh. And he kind of looked at me and I said, you don't turn your hips when you're, when you're hitting the golf ball. And he went, oh my, right? I said, what's your ready position when, you, when you're wrestling? And he immediately got into this very athletic position and, you know, like looking right at me. And I'm going, uh-huh, look at the way you're positioned when you, you, you start off the tee. And from that point on, he played the best golf of his life and broke 100 for one of the, I mean, the second or third time in his life. He was very, you see, you get, and even thanked that, that me was, at the end that, of the round. He says that made that one tip about my hips made all the difference for me. Well, see, so you did something there that, that that good teachers are able to do. Uh, you you got him to relate to something that he could that he does, uh, so that he could. It wasn't foreign to him, uh, and and that's it. That was a, that was great. That was very astute on your part because um, a lot of people teach. Uh, but they're more than they're more pontificating than teaching, uh, and you made him re- relate to something that he does in, in in a different sport, but was germane to the sport he was playing. So that was great, that was great, great stuff. It, you know, it, uh, I play with a lot of fellows that I teach, uh, and when we're out there playing, you know, they're they're trying to show me how good they're doing and so forth, and I I understand all that uh, because when I've played with touring pros, I did the same darn thing. Um, but I try to stay away from quick tips, uh, other than to say, you, you might want to slow it down a little bit, or you might, you, uh, you know, you might want to widen your stance a bit, but I don't get into too many swing tips because if, if they overemphasize that they're going to fall apart at the seams and then they're going to be looking at you and said, you ruined my day. They're not going to say it, but they're going to feel it. So sure. you have to be, <laughs> you have to be. Be careful with tips on the golf course, but that was real smart on your part. Well, thank you. I was actually fishing he, for the compliment. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, no, that was because you got him to equate to something else, but something that he's comfortable doing. See, so yeah. that's great stuff. Yeah. Well, the first teacher that I ever had in golf, his first question, and this was huge for me. His first question was, "What sports did you play as a kid?" And from that point on, he just made me, you know, he put it in those terms you know, of what, what sports that I played and how I can translate that into improving in my golf. And I always thought that was an incredibly valuable tool because I, all I did was ask the kid a question. He, he fixed it himself. He, once he realized what it meant in relation to his golf game, I didn't do a thing. I just made an observation to him. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, I'll just tell you a real quick story. Uh, one time I was in, inside the pro shop. I was watching the guy on the range, and he pulled up. He had this beautiful set of Callaway clubs, beautiful bag. <clears throat> I mean, he, he had invested a lot in product. He gets up there, and I'm watching him, and a pretty strong-looking guy, and he was slicing everything. I mean, just sad. And I kept watching him, so I, I thought, I can't handle it anymore. So I went out, and I said, let me ask you something. Have you ever played baseball? He says, yeah, I was a really good baseball player. I says, uh, just take out a, a club and, and imagine that you're hitting a low pitch. How would you, how would you hit a low pitch? And he, you know, he swung with a, a kind of a baseball action, re- released his hands, released the club head. And I said, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. I said, now why don't you treat that golf ball like it's a low pitch? Just go ahead and take a good baseball cut at it. And, of course, he hit a ball out there with a little bit of a draw. And he looked at me like, you know, like God has spoken to him. So he hit he, little by little by little. You could see he was now using, he was swinging the club in a emotion that he was familiar with. And and that's really, uh, as a boy, when I first caddied, I caddied so I could make enough money to buy clothes for school. Uh, and I could play baseball pretty good as a young kid. Like a lot of young kids, we all played baseball. And that's what I, that's, those were my first thoughts hit a golf ball was just to hit the back of that ball with a baseball with a kind of a baseball action and i could clobber the thing right off the bat i i never i never sliced the ball when i started playing because i equated it more to baseball now if i had been given some formal lessons i'm sure i would have sliced the heck out of the ball so uh, 
sometimes sometimes those are the best lessons when you when you can open up a guy's or a gal's mind to something that they've done in their past when it comes to hitting a golf ball, especially women. Gosh, I, I, I teach a lot of women, and, and I, I talk to them. Have you ever played baseball? Have you ever played tennis? And then we 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 try to use a similar stroke, and it works like magic. Well, Tony, I don't want to say I don't want to equate you with God, but there's something godlike. No, 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 wait, wait. Let me finish my sentence, my friend. There is something godlike about great teachers, and you are a great teacher. And I really appreciate you spending so much time with me every time I call. Thank you. I, I listen. I love your show, uh, and I, I know the the listeners to your podcast love your show. And to be a small part of it is really an honor for me. Believe me. 